Uh, good morning. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, hopefully you can just see Narinda and I in some new host spotlight function that we're trying out this morning. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this morning we're going to be hearing from Narinda Hoti uh, from Griffin Law. He's going to be talking about director's duties. Um, I don't know about you, but I've often heard people talk about, you know, desperate to get directorships and they see it as uh, kind of a status symbol, I suppose, but um, often don't really think about the uh, the responsibilities that go with that, which are, I understand, fairly onerous. And of course, there could be zero financial upside uh, of being a director, depending on your own personal uh, circumstances, obviously. So uh, really important for those who are looking at taking on directorships. Lots and lots of law firms nowadays are, are set up as limited companies with directors rather than partners. Um, so um, really important for those that are taking that step to understand exactly what their liabilities and responsibilities are. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, that we're going to be hearing from uh, Narinda this morning. So uh, thanks, Narinda. Um, just a few uh, notes before we get started. Um, with this view, I, I, I don't know what your functionality is in terms of being able to turn your video on and unmute yourself, but uh, please do stay muted. Um, if you have any questions at all, then we, we you know, we're always looking for questions. Uh, I'll, I'll have a couple ready to go at the end, but uh, always like to hear questions from the floor. So uh, if you do have a question, please use the chat facility, which is at the bottom. Um, if, you, if you put your cursor down to the bottom, it will come up. I think it's set up so that it'll automatically uh, default to you sending that chat to the hosts only. Um, but do bear in mind, there might be a, an option there for you to send it to hosts only or everyone. So um, I leave that up to you, but might be best to choose the hosts only when you're when you're putting a question in. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, I, hopefully you were all notified of that when you were uh, logging in, but it is being recorded. So uh, just be aware of that. But as none of you are on view at the moment, uh, that shouldn't make too much of a difference. Uh, I think that's it. You'll hear from me a little bit at the end. Um, and uh, for now, I will hand you over to Narinda. Narinda, hi. Thanks. Hi, Ian. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Um, so, yes, director duties. And actually, you make a fair point, actually. Griffin Law are a limited company made up of directors. We're not a traditional partnership in the slightest. So um, that's quite um, a good segue into who Griffin Law are. Um, we're a niche litigation practice. We're based down in Kings Hill. Um, we act for anyone uh, subject to disputes um, or anyone that may have a dispute against them or whether they want to pursue one against uh, someone or a company. Um, we aim to get to know our clients and assist them in protecting themselves and their businesses, both in the present moment and in the future. Um, we don't dabble in other areas of law. Um, we, set, we do focus specifically on litigation, um, but obviously one commercial clients that we have we like to be able to look after them in a long-term uh, fashion that if certain things like this come up we either are able to refer out or able to provide advice as to our perspective on, on from a litigation front and to avoid conflict um, so what I want to cover in today's short seminar is or webinar is um, directors duties and shareholder duties what penalties for breach there are and the potential relief from liability. Um, any director must ask themselves whether they really know their responsibilities as a director and or a shareholder. And I'm hoping that today's webinar is gonna provide you with a summary guidance as to what to look out for and what responsibilities each both the director and or shareholder would have. So let's set the scene with an example. Um, Flamingo Limited requires a funding injection they're only able to achieve this by attracting younger directors to the business. It's a family run business. Therefore, the children agree offhand to be directors of the company. The children, Fred and Felicity, agree without any independent legal advice to be named as directors of that company. Company's house filings are done. And before they're even aware of it, they're directors of a company with duties governed by the companies at 2006. I'm not going to say that it's guaranteed that there's going to be a breach of directorship or as a result of that scenario of them not taking any advice. Um, but however, you'd like there is a requisite that if advice was taken as to what it actually means to become a director, there's a real chance that without that, there's going to be a breach of the director duties under the Companies Act 2006. So just moving on first to the types of directors. So 
I haven't got time today to discuss in length the varying different types of directors and really get into the intrinsics of it. But in summary, and you've got executive directors and non-executive directors. Executive directors, are they're the highest ranking. Um, they're fully employed by the company. They, um, they have the ultimate responsibility for making managerial decisions and in, are involved in the routine management of the company. On the other hand, you've got the non-executive directors. They're not employees of the company. Um, they don't engage in day-to-day -day management of the organisation, but they are responsible for monitoring the executive directors. They're responsible for acting in the interest of the company stakeholders. Um, and they're also involved in policy making. So moving on specifically to the role of those directors. The general role of a director is to take charge of a company's business which includes making strategic and operational decisions for the benefit of the company. A director will have to have responsibility to participate in board meetings, to reach decisions, to make sure the company fulfills their obligations. Directors are agents of the company and they're appointed by the shareholders to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the company. Moving on then to director duties, these are listed out, seven general duties are listed out in the companies at 2006, but if I just run through the seven which are on the slide. So you have acting within your, within your powers, promoting the success of a company, exercising independent judgment, exercising reasonable care, skill and diligence, duty to avoid conflicts of interest, not to accept benefits from third parties and to de declare any interest in the proposed transaction or the arrangement with a company. To satisfy, it must be said that to satisfy one of those duties, it shouldn't be at the detriment to another duty. So, for example, you shouldn't breach your conflict of interest so as to promote the success of the company. So let's go back to the example that I gave at the beginning. Fred and Felicity decide to meet with a new customer. They start to become actively involved in the company. So they meet with this new customer. This new customer pays for their lunch, not thinking any, anything else by Fred and Felicity. Fred and Felicity are there obviously promoting the success of the company, but what they fail to do is to avoid accepting the benefit of, from the third party. Had they have had a better understanding of what their general duties are under the companies at 2006, that could have potentially been avoided. <clears throat> One of the big questions that comes up is duration. How long does a director's duty last? So the general principle is when you start to become a director, your duties will step in. And when you cease to be a director, they'll end. However, there's some aspects of those duties that arguably continue after you've been a director of the company, such as conflict of interest and not accepting benefits from a third party. Let me give you another example with the characters that I've used, Fred and Felicity. Fred decides to resign as a director of Flamingo Limited. He's had, he's new, he has a new interest in a similar, but, um, a similar but new area of expertise and has been offered directorship at Parrot Limited. Um, the resignation is amicable. Fred finds himself on the other side of a commercial transaction for which he has information relating to a former client customer of Flamingo Limited. Fred will therefore have an ongoing relationship to not cause a conflict of interest, i.e. benefit Parrot Limited over Flamingo Limited or their customer. This segues quite nicely into limitation <coughs> under litigation and bringing a cause of action or defending a cause of action. So director's duties, as I say, can survive them seizing as a director for that company. So it's logical to discuss limitation periods. The Limitation Act 1980 states that a claim of this nature would not would become statute barred after six years. However, directors are not able to rely on this standard six year limitation period if they are in breach of their duties of the company. One of the exceptions of the general principle under the Limitation Act 1980 is contained within Section 21 of the Act and applies to claims relating to a fundamental breach of trust by a trustee. It's been, long it's been long established that directors of a company can be trustees for their purposes, but there's been some doubt as how far that extends. The Court of Appeal case, which is listed again on the slide, First Subsidy Limited versus Baltac Limited and others in, from 2017, has clarified that it essentially applies to any fraudulent breach of a fiduciary duty of a, by a director. 
What this means is that if a breach can be categorised as fraudulent, not criminal fraudulent, but fraudulent, then the companies can potentially bring claims against the directors after the event, so and quite long after the event. So if a breach was dishonest, in bad faith or reckless, and then a longer period is in place to be able to bring that claim. So circumstances would have to be looked at and we would have to assess it on a case by case basis as to whether the Limitation Act falls within the normal six year limitation of statute barring or whether there is some reason why it would fall outside of it and we would work on an extension of that limitation period. If I can quickly move on to shareholders. <clears throat> So directors can sometimes find themselves to be both directors and shareholders of the company, which is why I thought it would be important to touch on this subject briefly today. So a shareholder of a company is effectively the company's financial supporter. They're both, they are part owners of the company and the shareholder will have certain rights and responsibilities to perform in their role for the company. Again, these are set out extensively in the Companies Act 2006 as well as the company's own Articles of Association. The Articles of Association can be the standard articles which the Companies Act provides or may have been drafted by a corporate lawyer to sit, fit your specific purposes for your company. So just moving on to the roles and duties of those shareholders. Shareholders are bound to attend meetings to make sure that directors don't go beyond their powers. They have a duty to approve major decisions that would affect the shareholders' rights and that special resolutions are signed upon the conclusion of all of those decisions. Again, this particular point comes back to causes of action in litigation, that we would always say that it's always important to document decisions that are made so, that, so as to avoid conflict later down the line. And even if conflict were to arise, we would have documentary support to refer back to, to hopefully conclude any dispute more commercially um, and in a much more timely fashion. So those documents will include who was there, what decisions were made and who signed off on the decisions that have been made. So let's just go back to directors and specifically the breach of directors duties. So general duties are owed to the company, therefore only the company will be able to enforce them as a general principle. There are, however, circumstances where shareholders may be able to bring claims such as derivative claims on behalf of the company. For those that are unfamiliar with what a derivative claim is, those are ones that are brought by a shareholder where they believe the director has been negligent or breached their duty as a director. There are also circumstances that in the event that the company is placed into liquidation, a claim can be brought under the Insolvency Act of 1986. So moving on from the breach of those duties are the penalties attached to the breaches. So a director in breach of their duties may be looking at the following penalties made against them, an injunction, damages and compensation. A failure to, I must also say that a failure to disclose an interest in an existing transaction or an arrangement with a company does carry a criminal fine. Um, Griffin Law practice specifically in commercial and civil litigation, criminal isn't something that we're practicing, but it's something that I would always mention and raise um, just to put it on radars for anyone that's in the position of a, as a director. <clears throat> so moving on now to relief from liability and insurance. As I said on the slide, the Companies Act 2006 governs the extent to which a director may be protected from liability. A company may indemnify a director against defence costs or costs incurred in an application to a court for relief under section 1157 of the Companies Act 2006. That's provided that this is on the proviso that the director would pay those costs back in the event that he or she is unsuccessful. A company can also at the outset purchase insurance for the benefit of protecting the directors against liabilities that are attached to them um, that are in connection with negligence, default, breach of duty or breach of trust. A court may also relieve a director from liability where proceedings for negligence, default breach of duty, or breach of trust are brought by a director, against a director, sorry, um, if they consider that the director has acted honestly and reasonably and they've considered all the circumstances. The latter of these examples is naturally where we've run the course of litigation and a court is involved where a judgment is provided as to determining 
whether this director has in fact acted negligently or not. There are naturally other duties and obligations in the event that the company comes insolvent, which would be covered under the insolvency back to 1986. Um, but that is a beast in itself and probably would require its own webinar. Um, and obviously, if you require more information on any of these duties, liabilities, then we can have conversations about better understanding the position that you're in as a director, the company, and ascertaining what steps they need to take, if, if any at all. Um, and just wanted to say a little bit more about Griffin Law, and then my disclaimers come up. <laughs> so if I just go to the disclaimer, that final slide is a, a short disclaimer. Um, it's legalese, so I'm not going to bore you with it, but obviously as a lawyer I have to make sure it's on there. Um, just to say that nothing I've given is advice and it's just a summary guidance as to what we're, what we're talking about. Um, and then if I just say a little bit about Griffin Law, obviously we are proud to say that we can offer flexible approaches to litigation. We can share the risk of litigation with you. Um, by that, I mean conditional fee agreements, contingency fee agreements, um, funding arrangements. Um, we have an open door policy. So even if you're not sure where something is going, but want to discuss the idea or the concept of litigation or a dispute that you may see in the future, then we have an open door policy and we welcome anyone to contact us and have that discussion with us so that we can build that relationship and, and, and work with you. Um, so we, and we really do pride ourselves on offering a, a fee structure that's that based not only on the claim, but would fit the client's circumstances. Um, that kind of brings me to the conclusion today uh, and I'm back to Ian. Um, and I'd like to thank you very much, Narinda. I'd like to um, invite people to uh, submit some questions. I, I have I have a few. Oh, um, <laughs> straight away. And obviously, one you know, trying to be, if we had more of a sort of discussion about some of these issues as well, that you yeah, know, absolutely. happy to have that that kind of yeah. format as well. Um, I, I, I sort of wrote down and underlined lunch with a with a customer uh, straight away. I thought that was a, an interesting point uh, that I thought mm. I'd go straight back to. So. Um, it's it's it is against the rules for a director to be taken to lunch by a customer of the business. Well, not not necessarily, but if it was, I would say that you have to it has to apply a log logical sense to it as well. You have to say to yourself, could it be determined as a bribe? Could you in that yes. lunch be talking about the potential for bringing a customer in? or getting some kind of additional benefit over and above your other directors and or the company. So the hard and fast rule, I think would be to say, I, I wouldn't accept, um, but that may be me as a lawyer as well. I don't accept gifts and lovely things from clients because it could be treated as a, an act of bribery of some kind as, and against my duty and obligations, even as a lawyer. Um, and that has to mirror through to you as a director if you don't have other directors sitting on the board and it's just you as a director of your own company, then that's something that you could happily I guess, engage in. But it's ultimately yeah. digging down into the act and talking about how it would interplay with the company and affect the other directors. Um, and could it be conceived as taking some kind of form of bribery from a potential customer or a customer to bring them on board? Okay, yeah, because we had what was there was I can't remember what year it was, but we had the bribery and corruption act, yes, right? This yeah. is what, late noughties, something like that. Yeah, I, I can't yeah, remember. it's not far away from the Companies Act. So, the Companies Act had a big overhaul, well, not even an overhaul, a big slap addition to to the Companies Act, which was the two thousand and six, yeah. um, and all of this kind of came into play and where the general duties were really set out in in the two thousand and six Act. Yes. Okay. And to what extent? I suppose we're getting into sort of <laughs> nasty legal tactical type stuff now. If you know, if we've got shareholders or other directors uh, who are unhappy with a with a director's performance or behaviour, do you do you see the use of these hard and fast rules being used as a way of right, right? We, we've got this person. We can we can report them because of something that might seem fairly small to some of us, but used as a tactic. Is it something that you've come um, across? Yes, <laughs> it depends how vindictive um or personal it can get so if you've got a board of three directors and one of those directors is 
evidently in conflict of their interests as a director and they're breaching those fiduciary duties. Yes, we probably would be talking to the directors that have got concerns about that. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't, as advisors, unless we've got to the point of no return, the first course of action would always be, can we resolve this amicably outside of formal litigation? Can we, on your behalf, arrange media, some kind of informal mediation where we can sit around a table and talk these issues through? Can we write a letter on those directors' behalf that have concerns about what the other director is doing? So as to mm -hmm. raise it and air it, not necessarily to go with the hard punch, but it depends on the scale at which you want to approach it. If you want the hard punch, then naturally, yes, we can give you the advice and say, yes, there's this breach and that breach. And ultimately, you need to be able to convert that into what your loss is. So if you're really going to go with a claim, you need to say, OK, conflict of interest is this. It's caused this much um, monetary loss to us or the company. And therefore, there, there is your claim. Um, mm -hmm. And you need those pieces of the puzzle to all fit together to even get to the the punch. Um, but some of these things have been rumbling would, be, would have been rumbling on for years, and they try to mm -hmm. brush it under the rug, and then eventually everything comes to head, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, it can be nasty, but <laughs> that's yeah. litigation, unfortunately. <laughs> And we've got a we've got a question in if, if a director does something wrong what what can a shareholder do I, I presume that might depend upon just how how many shares that shareholder has but um shareholders well, against yeah directors? yeah so yeah it's circumstantial on the shareholding um but for, if you take all that away without knowing the intrinsics of the company it would be a derivative action so mm -hmm can they identify that there's been a breach of these fiduciary duties has the director been negligent in their actions on behalf of the company which has had an ultimate effect for the shareholders and the shareholder can then bring the appropriate claim um against those directors under, under derivative claim yeah okay and one other thing we're uh, I, I run a recruitment business and uh I'm sure like lots of other industries, we're, we're particularly keen on restrictive covenants in, in, yes. in contracts or, or in shareholders agreements. Uh, something that struck me with regards to you talking about sort of the ongoing duties, even once you're, you know, you're, you're an ex-director mm. of that business for up to six years. Does this mean that actually that firms might put too much, you know, worry too much about restrictive covenants when in actual fact, lots of it's covered by those ongoing responsibilities for, for the six year period? Um I would always advise that having it in writing is better than assuming the how it would fit within legislation. Legislation is naturally there and case law is naturally there that gives you a scope, gives a boundary, gives you boundaries. But how your circumstances fit into it can be but circumstantial. So mm -hmm. if you as a company have sat down and you've identified what you require from the individual and you've documented that, that is much better than being able to rely on the legislation as it as is and how the circumstances mm -hmm. may fit in um, that's not to say on the other side we wouldn't try our hardest to unwind or unravel those restrictive covenants that you've got the person tied into because that's also part of the job if if person on the other side isn't happy with the restrictive covenants they want to go and set up a competing business and they're like these restrictive covenants are far too um they ca they carry on for far too long mm -hmm. there are there are those circumstances where they want they want out um and then you as a company have to make a decision of does it really commercially affect you and do you want to avoid the the litigation in the long run by just coming to an amicable conclusion with the with the other person or party yeah. depending on the situation yeah okay and who's uh, complete layman's question here, but who's who's the regulatory authority here? If, ah. if we've got, say, a director <laughs> saying, oh, we want another director out, we're shit certain they're in breach of their duties, who do they go to and who who, who comes off? <laughs> that's us. <laughs> I'd like to think that's Griffin Law. So every director, <laughs> every director, I, you know, I, there isn't a, a regulatory body. I mean, you've got, you've got Companies House, you've got HMO, you've got that body sitting there. Um, mm -hmm. 
they will obviously look at more on the administrative side of things of have filings been done accounts been done and they will alert as to breaches of certain elements of it but where we're talking mm -hmm. about fundamental breaches of the company's act and breaches of fiduciary duties those are set mm -hmm. out within either the company documents themselves or the legislation like i've said and you'll mm -hmm. you'll ultimately if you believe that there's risk of a breach of those be speaking mm -hmm. to your lawyers you'll be if you know speaking to your company lawyer speaking to your personal lawyer depending on the circumstances um and ascertaining whether there is a breach and what can be done about it i don't if i, I imagine if we had a regulatory body for absolutely everything in life we just wouldn't move would we <laughs> and i say that as a lawyer with the sra being down yeah. on me <laughs> and and but but I presume there would be you, you mentioned that there would there could be some uh, criminal recourse uh, on some, something. So so eventually it's the case that who gets involved to enforce those criminal proceedings? Well, and it, and it could be the opposing party. So if it's found mm. that the acts that's been cap if say for example somebody came to me and they explained a certain situation where I say well it doesn't really fit into the civil. Um, pocket it's much more mm -hmm. of a criminal action and you need to take it along a criminal route then mm -hmm. it will be that individual pursuing as a as a criminal action against mm -hmm. the individual um it doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be the cps i can't speak for criminal because i've really i haven't done it for about 15 years now <laughs> uh, but you have done it so, yeah, yeah. um okay uh, well i'll i'll um, leave it open to anyone else. If, if, if you want to ask uh, any questions, then, then please do put it in the chat box. Otherwise, if, unless something pops up in the next minute or so, then we'll be, we'll be wrapping up. Um, so uh, clearly your advice would be that people need to be seeking some advice upon taking up a, a directorship. Um, are, there in, are there individual uh, insurance policies for aimed at the individuals rather than the companies? Yeah, so you can get directors and officers liability insurance. Oh, that's, um, which that's DNO, you, of course. It yeah, the DNO, okay. which can protect you individually as a director as to your where your responsibilities are and actions that you take as a director. The DNO can come in place and and that really does protect you in the long run. So if a mm -hmm. individual or shareholder even said, oh, so and so has been negligent in their actions as a director, you'd fall upon the DNO if it if you really needed to and we couldn't deal with it amicably the first port of call with any litigation and i think anyone at griffin law would say it and i'm hoping any good litigator would say it that you would try to deal with these things in the most amicable fashion to so as to avoid a conflict really exploding you don't mm -hmm. want a situation where you as litigators we will do everything to avoid it actually going to a court for a judge mm -hmm. to look at the situation and make that decision if you can deal with it before the event and take control of who's saying what, what kind of negotiation you can come to. <clears throat> and that's not to say you can't do it, excuse me. <clears throat> that's not to say you can't do it whilst you're in litigation. It's just the fact that it runs in tandem. You've got your litigation running whilst you're also tra trying to negotiate. So if you can try and do the, your best and hardest to negotiate and deal with the situation prior to issuing a claim, then yeah. let's try um, and, you know, myself and my colleagues are really keen to work that way so as to avoid the hefty cost and because once you're on that train it doesn't stop going um until you get to a conclusion and that's either you agreeing just between yourselves or a judge comes to the conclusion which is why i mentioned about a judge determining whether they've been honest or dishonest or um coming to their conclusion as to what the director's done or not done sure okay well, thank you, uh, Narinda. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just, if we can just pop the slide on, um, I'm just going to mention um, one or two upcoming events that we have at the NBC. Um, if we can Gemma. go forward on the slide, Gemma, that'd be lovely. Thank you. There I am. That's me again. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually quiz master at the YPN quiz. Uh, it's only th it's Thursday the 7th. I've still got to write for probably 60 or 70 questions. I've got a bit of work to do for that. But the YPN is back uh, and is having what pretty much been an annual quiz, but obviously didn't happen last year. Uh, Safri Champness are, are kindly hosting on Thursday the 7th of October. It is a physical event at uh, Safri's offices uh, down by Mansion House, a six o'clock start. 
if it's anything like previous years then there's um there'll be plenty of food uh, and good networking i think there are still some spots available but it'll be a pretty popular event but that's always very lively it's not a team event uh, people get uh, assigned into teams so there's good networking within the quiz teams as well uh, and if you have any young professionals people within perhaps the first four or five years of qualification, if they're accountants or lawyers, et cetera, then we'd love to see them there. It's a really good way. The wipe is an excellent way for young professionals to take those sort of first networking steps. Um, we have some welcome back drinks uh, on Wednesday, the 13th of October, again at six o'clock. Uh, and that is being hosted by um, NYX London, which is, I believe NYX is a hotel group that bought some of the Grange hotels. So I'm pretty certain that NYX London Hotel is uh, the one at the bottom of uh, Southampton uh, Row. Uh, well, actually, sorry, probably at the top end of Southampton Row. Uh, um, and um, so it'd be lovely to see you there. Just a chance to get free drinks, a chance to get back together. Uh, it's been so long since lots of us saw each other at, uh, at the NBC. So to be, that'd be great to get together. Uh, and then on looking slightly further ahead to Thursday, the 18th of November, um, Anne informs me that it's not really TBC. We're, we're very close. We just need to sort of um, uh, rubber stamp the uh, the venue for that. Uh, it's pretty much done now. But there's going to be a morning event at eight o'clock, uh, kindly supported by, by the Chancery Lane Association. The Stay Health Wealthy programme has been really well attended. It's all about uh, staying healthy at work. It can be anything from uh, stress management and psychological issues to physical issues and how we sit at our desks. Uh, I have got no idea whether my chair at home is any good for my back whatsoever. I'm pretty certain it's not. Uh, and I'm sure there's a whole booming business in, in sort of office chairs for home environment nowadays. Um, but they are really uh, well attended, popular events. Uh, and um, we're looking forward to that on the 18th of November. Uh, so just a few things. Obviously, there'll be some more events coming coming up in the future as well. We've got to look forward to hopefully to some Christmas drinks. Let's keep fingers crossed that... Uh, uh, we're able to carry on uh, and uh, not go into any other lockdown periods this winter. Um, there should also be a chance to network between events. Uh, Gemma, if we can just go on to the next slide, uh, just with our sort of Twitter hand. There we are. Uh, so do do follow us on LinkedIn. Do if you've got anything that you want to talk about, uh, whether it be um, you know work issues or or personal issues on LinkedIn. I I might be uh, marketing my my charity Rose that I'm doing next week. That might be coming up on LinkedIn very quickly. Um, but if you want to follow us on Twitter, etc., then then please do. Um, all, all left for me to say is that um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, Narinda, um, thank you uh, so much. It was really informative. Um, we're, we're indebted to you as, um, you know, as our members for, for coming up with topics and, and, and uh, choosing to host these events. So thank you very much for doing so. Um, I know Gemma, um, all of us will be thanking Gemma. Gemma Bulldog's been working hard in the background to make sure this webinar uh, runs very smoothly, and I'm sure it has. Uh, so thank you very much to both of you uh, and thank you to everyone for, for joining us this morning uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, future events very very soon um, and um, work well take care bye bye thanks bye